From woven sails to slavery, Viking lovers, this episode is for you. Hello and welcome to the Medieval Grad Podcast, brought to you by Medievalists.net. It's a podcast where we meet and chat with graduate students and early career researchers from all over the world to learn about the new trends in medieval studies. I'm Lucie Lemonnier, a medieval historian and the podcast host. Today, we're talking with Sarah Christensen, a PhD student in history at Brown University, working under the supervision of Dr. Jonathan Conant. Hello, Sarah. Thank you very much for being here. Hi, Lucie. It's great to be here. First, tell us a little bit about yourself. What got you interested in medieval history? Yeah, so I think as a kid, I always loved history. And when I was in college, I took a class with Jonathan Conan. And that class was on the Viking Age. Um, and I just, something about it really caught my attention, um, especially the role of women um, in Viking society. And that pretty much set my path. Um, and that's what I'm doing now. So your research looks at gender and slavery in the context of the Viking diaspora. Maybe you could start by telling us what Viking diaspora means. Sure. So I'll start by giving a little history of the word Viking, um, and then I'll explain the choice of the term diaspora. Okay. So there's still a debate about history of the word Viking, um, but the etymology that I at least find the most plausible um, connects back to an Old Norse term, Vik, uh, which meant a bay or inlet. And you'll see this term still in modern Icelandic, um, a language which is almost unchanged from the original Old Norse spoken by Iceland settlers in place names like Reykjavik or Keflavik. And when Scandinavians went Viking, they were simply off sailing, mm. uh, though Viking or Viking eventually came to connote a particular kind of long distance sailing trip usually for the purposes of trading, uh, but also raiding. Uh, but at heart, Vikings were simply long distance sailors. And now it's kind of a relatively recent trend in the field to use the term diaspora to describe this movement of people out of Scandinavia, mostly from what is now Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, between about the 8th and 11th centuries. And diaspora describes a specific kind of population movement, which unlike a kind of linear migration, usually implies the spread of people in multiple directions. So the Greek root, sorry, <laughs> the Greek root word means to sow, as in to spread seeds. Mm. Uh, diaspora also emphasizes interconnectedness among migrant groups in multiple regions, uh, a sort of shared identity traced back to the homeland and persisted for generations. Um, so for these reasons, the term diaspora is being used more and more often to describe uh, the Viking migrations. Um, a number of scholars, including uh, Judith Jesh, who's very well known in Viking Age studies, um, she published a book in 2015 called The Viking Diaspora, um, which kind of emphasized this sense of shared heritage and interconnectedness among far-flung settlers. And in terms of a geographical frame, it means England, Iceland, Greenland, uh, maybe like kind of North Russia, the Baltic countries, is that correct? Yes, exactly. We often talk about uh, the Western Viking diaspora, which includes what are usually called the North Atlantic Isles. So that would be kind of Iceland, Ireland, Great Britain, Um, and also including uh, the Orkney Islands, the Shetland Islands, and the Faroe Islands. And then the Eastern Viking diaspora, which includes kind of the Baltic regions um, and Russia, and even further into the Middle East um, and like Constantinople. All right, so a large geographical frame. Yes. And are you taking all these um, areas into account for your own research? Personally, I focus mostly on the Western Viking diaspora, and that's largely a linguistic choice. Um, if, if I were to study the Eastern Viking diaspora, that would require some facility with Arabic uh, and also probably Old Church Slavonic, neither of which I have. Um, so the Western Viking diaspora is, is easier in that sense. All right. As I mentioned, you look at uh, gender and slavery, and we know that unfreedom took many forms in the Middle Ages. And even if it was not at the same scale as in the Roman Empire, slavery and, and freedom never really disappeared. 
So I'm wondering what slavery meant in the Viking world, or to, to be more specific, what was the legal status of enslaved individuals? And I'm also wondering how widespread it was. Yeah, so you're right that unfreedom takes many forms. I think it's one of the slipperiest terms in medieval studies. It's so dependent on specific contexts, and it's really difficult to pin down any kind of generalizable definition. And that's no different in the Viking world, where our evidence for slavery is pretty slim and pretty difficult to interpret. So there are kind of two main sources for understanding slavery. The first would be the legal evidence, the written law codes that are preserved from various parts of medieval Scandinavia. And the second is literature. And that's primarily the sagas, which were written down mostly in Iceland beginning in the 12th century. And from both of these, it's clear that there was an established social stratum, which consisted of people with limited rights who performed specific forms of dependent labor and could be bought and sold and used as currency. So in Old Norse, there are terms like thrail for a man, um, which is the origin of the modern word enthralled and ambout for a woman, both of which seem to refer specifically to unfree people. And in terms of legal status, the written evidence we have is heavily influenced by Roman law, um, much like other law codes in early medieval Europe. So by the time Norse law codes are written down in the early 12th century, as opposed to transmitted orally as they once had been, their compilers had interacted with and imitated the societies and documentary cultures of Christian continental Europe. So it's really difficult for scholars to kind of excavate any pre-Christian legal precepts. But we know that slavery was widespread throughout early medieval Europe, and that included the Viking world, though it operated differently according to kind of regional traditions everywhere. So how did um, free people acquired, quote, uh, these slaves, was it by uh, raids and so capture, or was it by international trade, so foreign merchants or Viking merchants bringing in people that they had bought elsewhere? Yeah, that's a great question. And it it's all of those things, we think. Certainly, Vikings were raiding. Um, there's a lot of evidence to that effect. A lot of it comes from non-Viking sources, so it's likely to be a little bit exaggerated. Uh, we have Irish sources and English sources uh, that speak about the Vikings kind of descending on a town and uh, rounding up all the women and children and selling them into slavery. Um, how much that happened is hard to say, but but we're pretty sure that, um, that it did. Uh, there also is likely to have been a form of hereditary slavery in Scandinavia. It's kind of unclear. Scholars don't necessarily agree about the extent of that institution, but there is some evidence to suggest that people could be born into slavery, that, that it could pass uh, across generations. And yeah, I mean, Vikings were significant slave traders. They captured people, um, let's say in Ireland and carried them across Europe, even all the way to Baghdad. We know that Vikings were selling enslaved people in the Middle East. So there was a lot of movement of enslaved people all across Europe um, in the hands of Viking traders. And this raises the question of Christianity, because in theory, and it's really a theory, Christians should not enslave other Christians. So how did Viking Christians, slave owners, navigate around that? Yeah, so that is one of the questions that uh, scholars you know, have tried to answer for a long time. It's how, how was slavery compatible with Christianity? At the beginning of the Viking Age, of course, Scandinavians trading in enslaved people would have been mostly pagans. Um, and there were few cultural prohibitions that we know of um, about yeah, who could or could not be enslaved. Uh, later, especially as Vikings settled in Ireland and England in the ninth century, they increasingly adopted Christianity. And as you said, Christian tradition kind of discourages the enslavement of fellow Christians. Um, there's one line from Paul's epistle to the Galatians, which reads, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And this line, a lot of scholars in the 20th century kind of took this line to mean that the church was very committed to the abolishment of slavery in the medieval period. That's kind of been argued against. Most people now agree that while the church might have 
kind of espoused equality before God. They also conformed to a lot of Roman social and legal precedents in their formal regulations, and they really only tried to kind of ameliorate the evils of slavery rather than suppressing it. Um, we don't have a lot of evidence concerning specifically Christian Viking slaveholders, but there is absolutely nothing to suggest that Christianity was in any way incompatible with slaveholding in the Viking world. Mm, okay. Let's now turn to the enslaved individuals themselves and their experiences of servitude. So who were they? What type of work would they undertake? Um, and also to go back to your research project, what about gender? Yeah, so as I said a little bit earlier, in the Western Viking diaspora, which is kind of Iceland, uh, Ireland, and Great Britain, um, enslaved people were mainly women. Um, and they came mainly from the regions around the Irish Sea, so those kind of coastal areas where Vikings were raiding and trading. Scholars have come to this conclusion about the gender nature of slavery and its location um, based on the evidence of material culture and genetic analysis and also medieval literature and genealogy. And in terms of what work enslaved people were doing, this kind of leads me to one of what I think is the most interesting pieces of material evidence for the experience of slavery, at least in Iceland, which comes from the work of Michelle Heyer Smith, uh, who is an archeologist affiliated with Brown's Kaffenreffer Museum. She's done a lot of work on Icelandic textiles and textile production was almost exclusively the work of women. And it took an enormous amount of time and woman power And one of my favorite facts is that the woolen sails, which propelled Viking ships, were made by women. And each one would have taken one woman about three years to make from start to finish. Oh, oh my God. So mostly women work together in groups to speed production. Um, but that is to say that all of the ships that were being sailed by these Viking raiders would not have existed were it not for the work of women. And in Michelle Smith's uh, research, She has identified a shift in the way that thread is spun in Icelandic textile workshops in the early Viking Age. So garments found in Icelandic burials from the 9th century used thread spun in a certain direction that was called ZZ spinning. And after the 10th century, textiles are quickly replaced by a version using thread spun in the other direction called ZS spinning. ZZ spinning is the standard in Western Norway, where most Icelandic settlers originated. And ZS spinning is the standard in England and Ireland and in continental Europe. Mm. So the spinning direction also has nothing to do with kind of different spinning technologies or tools. It's purely a kind of habit, like holding a knife in your left hand or your right hand, something that you pick up from the way that your mother does it. Yeah. So Smith and others argue that this shift from ZZ Norwegian style spinning to a ZS style might be connected with the arrival of large numbers of women from Ireland and England during the 10th century when they took over textile production and brought their habits with them. It's very interesting. And so were they working, I don't know if there are evidence, but were they working in kind of workshops or was it one family had one slave, another family had one slave? You know, was it organized or kind of still household based? Yes. So the evidence for slavery shows us that household slavery is almost ubiquitous in Iceland. Um, almost every medium to large scale household would have had at least one slave and probably several. And they would have been mostly women and their jobs would have been mostly to produce textiles. So in a smaller home, you might have only one enslaved woman. Um, and she might work alongside the woman of the house, um, producing textiles, spinning thread. But in a larger farm, perhaps you'd have up to 10 enslaved women. And you might even have a separate workshop, a building where the women would work. And I think to me, it's interesting because you would have women probably from different backgrounds working together, spending a lot of time with each other sharing the various habits that they brought with them from their diverse origins. And it's, unfortunately, we don't have any sources that get us inside those textile workshops. Yeah, since they probably have created a sense of community, of sisterhood, especially being of such low status. And Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I have another follow-up question. 
first it starts with a comparison like in the south of Europe. Um, I work in the south of France and there were slaves, mostly women, and they were doing a lot of household work and potentially also being sadly used for sex. Do you think it was the case or not uh, in your sources? Yes, absolutely. As horrifying as it is, I think and most scholars would agree that the enslavement of women probably anywhere in in the medieval period involved sexual slavery. And there is evidence to that effect. Uh, there's one particular story that's one of my favorites um, from the Icelandic sources of a woman named Melkorka. And she's purchased uh, by an Icelandic man uh, at a market in Denmark. And as the saga says, he slept with her that night um, and then took her home and she worked in his house and she gave birth to his son. Uh, and that's just one example. And obviously we don't have many stories of enslaved women, but to me that's representative of what was almost certainly the case for most of them. Mm. And so what, what would be the status of children born out of that kind of um, rape? Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. And it differs somewhat between various regions in Scandinavia. And also the little that we know does come from law codes that where it's hard to determine how realistic what we know from the laws, you know, was in society. For the most part in Scandinavia and certainly in Iceland, children born to a free father would themselves have been free. Uh, that was probably different for male and female children at times. I think it's more likely that a female child may have entered enslavement, whether or not her father was free, um, just because of the overwhelming gendered nature of slavery itself. Uh, but free, the sons of enslaved women were mostly treated as free men. Uh, so Sarah, I'd like to hear about the sources you work with. What are they and what do they tell us and uh, tell you about slavery and the Viking diaspora? So in my research, I've mainly worked with the Icelandic sagas. They really are, I think, one of the most incredible resources to have come down to us from the Middle Ages. Uh, the sagas were almost all written in Iceland in the Old Norse vernacular with most manuscripts dating to around the 13th and 14th centuries. There are several saga genres, but the most numerous and the ones that I use the most are called the Islandinga Sogar or the sagas of the Icelanders, uh, sometimes also called the family sagas because they are concerned with particular families. The majority of these texts are written about Iceland's settlement period in the 9th and 10th, in the 9th and 10th centuries which has caused a lot of consternation for historians because it's hard to tell how much of the sagas consist of reliable traditions carried down over the centuries that might preserve some genuine evidence about earlier society or how much is kind of a nostalgia tinged myth-making uh, like modern American stories about Paul Revere's ride or George Washington's cherry tree since the sagas are about as distant from the events they describe as like I am from the American colonial period. Yeah, is it kind of an accurate historical sources or is it a sort of narrative arranged and tailored to the circumstance and as you mentioned, in kind of a memorial dimension? Exactly. And in one of the papers you sent me, you mentioned that some historians um, hold that slavery was on the decline in the 13th century, but you said that it might actually be a bias induced by these particular sources, the sagas. Could you elaborate on that? Sure. So that idea kind of begins uh, with a historian named Ruth Mazo Karras, who is a very prominent scholar of medieval Scandinavia. And actually in her doctoral dissertation, she argued that slavery had become almost obsolete in Iceland by the 13th century. And she thought that between the 9th and 11th centuries, Icelandic society operated according to a very clear binary. You were either free or unfree, and there was really nothing in between. And freedom meant the ability to participate in the political community in Iceland. So attending assemblies, bringing lawsuits, both men and women theoretically had that freedom, although the extent to which women really were allowed to exercise it is unclear. And unfree people were totally excluded from this political community. And then beginning in the 12th century, 
as landowners became increasingly powerful and morphed into a kind of hereditary nobility, Harris argued that this expectation that all free people could participate equally in the political community began to break down. And so the category of free people became increasingly stratified, which sort of obviated the need for a category of slave because slave enslaved people were just one of many low status persons in society. But recently, I think that people have started to argue against this somewhat. Um, I think Karis's assertions have merit in terms of changes in the perception of unfreedom, uh, but historians have started to argue that slavery itself did not disappear. So uh, there's a historian named David Wyatt who has kind of pointed to the frequency of slave narratives in the Icelandic family sagas as evidence that slavery was still a very ordinary part of Icelandic life in the 13th century. There was a very active slave trading port in Dublin and that port closed in the 12th century with the Anglo-Norman conquest of Ireland. Uh, but we can see that the trading activities that took place there simply transferred to the ports of Normandy. Viking traders also pushed further eastward and captured slaves in the Slavic lands. So slave trading remained a very important part of Icelandic commerce um, up until the 13th century. Last question to conclude. Sarah, what advice would you give to a prospective grad student? I have to say, I think I would really recommend both applying to and entering grad school with an open mind. And that might sound kind of simple or trite, uh, but it's been really important to me um, in my research so far. I think it can be kind of exciting and tempting to simply just dig deeper and deeper into your own area of expertise and to feel like you know everything there is to know about a subject. I came into my PhD as a medieval Scandinavianist. I love Vikings and I thought I would study the sagas forever, but I've extended my research much further beyond my original topic and that's been really rewarding. So I think I would suggest that people be as open-minded as possible and explore really far outside of your comfort zone or your area of expertise. Thank you, Sarah. I learned a lot about the Vikings today. Thank you, Lucy. It was great to be here. That was Sarah Christensen, a PhD student from Brown University. You can find Sarah's info in the show notes. Stay with us because the episode isn't over yet. Let's bring in Peter Konechny from Medievalist.net. Hi, Peter. How are you doing? What did you think of the interview? Hi, Lucy. Yeah, uh, you know, it's it's always good to uh, hear about when people are researching the kind of so-called like lower classes of societies, you know, like in some cases peasants, but here slaves. Like traditionally, historians haven't been very interested in that kind of area. Like, you know, what was life like uh, if you were in slavery? And uh, so, yeah, like I, I thought it was really good. So I, I, I quite enjoyed, quite enjoyed the episode. I, I, sometimes I want these episodes to be longer. So yeah, me too. I really loved it. And well, I don't know if you know you out there listening. I'm more of a historian of the Mediterranean, and so I'm familiar with slavery in the Mediterranean. And when I found uh, Sarah's profile on uh, Brown's website, I was like, oh my God, the Viking also had slaves? I had no idea. And so it's a complete oversight for me. And that's why I was, you know, uh, drawn to interviewing her and learning more about that. And I was so fascinated. It was really interesting. The the, the thing about the, the woven sails was really kind of mind blowing for me. I found it so interesting. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. It is like I, you know, I heard a lot about slavery in the context of like Viking raids and like the kind of slave trade, more more or less, that goes uh, from say Ireland uh, through Scandinavia into the Mediterranean region. But uh, yeah, like this kind of you, domestic slavery uh, that's happening in Iceland, you know, is 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 something that's really not talked about like but it's it's there in the sources like the Icelandic sagas and like I, I one of the things I re I really love the Icelandic sagas I think they're just great great stories so and there's always been a question uh, is like how historically accurate are they you know if we you know if you look at Egil's saga or Njal's saga mm -hmm. 
Uh, like, you know, is it just is it just literature or is it how realistic are they to the events and the people that they were describing? So um, but yeah, like, you know, and, and you look back, yeah, sla- you know, slaves kind of pop in there from time to time. And if you just read it like, you know, going through it, you know, you, you don't necessarily catch on to that. But the, yeah, like she's really kind of able to mind that kind of sources. Uh, would you recommend to our audience any kind of sagas uh, in translation? I'm assuming that you don't you do not read all Norse. So <laughs> probably <laughs> Yeah, no, no, I don't I don't need all the Norse, but like yeah, tons and tons of them are are have been translated. Uh I think Nyal Saga it's it's kind of a, again like a just uh events around the turn of the millennium uh is a really compelling kind of story just on its own. You know, I do my kind of research like on the Sterlanga sagas which are 13th century. And uh, what's happening at that time is, is, is the closest thing we have to the like, chronicles of, of what's happening in Iceland. So, um, but Njal Saga, Egil Saga, uh, you know, there, there's tons and tons. There's great, like, there's ones that are kind of comedic. Mm. Uh, there's ones that are really kind of very sad stories. So, and uh, and if, if you're interested, there's a great podcast called The Sag- Saga Thing. Oh. Where they uh, uh, where they kind of go in and they kind of really dive deep into these uh, uh, sagas. So basically, if you want to spend you know, uh, you know, ten hours listening to uh, a couple of guys talk about one obscure Icelandic saga, you know, that is a place to go. So yeah, and Sarah recommended Ruth Madokara's book on unfreedom that really focuses on uh, slavery and unfreedom in Scandinavia. And she also mm-hmm. told me uh, once we had finished the podcast that she will send me the link to the Woven Sales article uh, so that we can put it in the show notes if you're interested uh, to in reading about that. Uh, any other reading uh, recommendation, Peter? Hey, well, you know, on Medieval Warfare magazine, which I edit, we, we did do a special issue on like Iceland. So I was really, really proud. And it, was, it deals this this Terlanga era. Uh, but yeah, so if you want, and uh, there is a really lovely article there about Njal Saga uh, and talking about daily life in Iceland. So yes, uh, I, I'll, I'll put that as well on the reading list. Thank you very much, Peter. Thanks. You are listening to the Medieval Grad Podcast, brought to you by Medievalist.net. If you want to support us and this podcast, you can subscribe to our Patreon, patreon.com slash medievalists. You can get a lot of very neat benefits on Patreon, including being able to hear these episodes early. We love doing this show and we really appreciate your help. I'm Lucie Lemonnier. You can find me on Instagram. My handle is at the French Medievalist. And you can also look me up on academia.edu. Thank you for tuning in. Goodbye. Au revoir.